Hi, welcome back to Highlander Heart and our second interview. Uh, Joe's here this time. Thank you. Yes. Uh, hello, Joe. I <laughs> Um, so last time uh, we were very uh, lucky. We got to speak to Adrian Paul. Uh, we couldn't start with anybody else. Um, this time I am really excited. I have to say I'm really excited. Uh, we have got someone who has, as far as, as I'm aware, uh, as we're aware, never really spoken about his time on Highlander. And yet he is such a, a large part of, of season sort of two and three. And yeah. um, so... Uh, yeah, this is this is going to be this is going to be great. I'm so excited. Um, so without further ado, here's Philip Aiken. Thank you so much for joining us. Seriously, thank you so much for joining us. I, I, you know, we we are so excited to have you. And and we were saying a, a moment ago, I don't think I've ever seen you talk about Highlander before. No, that's 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 very true. And, and thank you, Amy, Grant, and Joe, uh, for having me here. Um, yeah, I, yeah. I, I don't, I don't spend a lot of time in the rearview mirror, you know. So, um, so I've kind of avoided it, uh, frankly. Um, but then I thought you caught me at a good time, so there you go. <laughs> Thank you. Perfect time. <laughs> I must have known somehow. I must have known. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you. I really appreciate it. So look, let's start at the beginning. I'm always curious to know uh, how you came to um, the arts and, uh, and, and acting and, you know, all, all of that encompasses and also your martial arts background as well, which is considerable. Um, so yeah. you know, what came first? Uh, did one lead to the other? You know, how did, how did that sort of manifest? Um, no, I started in theater when I was a when I was a kid, really. Um, uh, I don't know how long you want these stories to be, but there you go. <laughs> so look, I, 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 my brother and I, Leighton, um, were very avid readers. And uh, every Saturday, we would take our parents' library cards, uh, because we'd read the children's library. And so we take our parents' library cards, we go to the library, we get 12 books out each, go home, start reading, and then do it again the next Saturday and the next Saturday. Nice. And they had a, a club at the library called, funnily enough, the Library Club. And uh, they got their hands on all the new books first. And so I thought, this would be great. I'll join that. But the fact is, the, it, the, the library club was really a bait and switch for a drama club. And while they did get the books first, basically what they did was theaters. They did plays. And so I got roped into doing my uh, first uh, play, which was Ali Baba and the Forty Thieves, uh, a spectacle of which no one could ever repeat. And I dragged all of my friends in to do stuff with it, right? So, um, and out of that group, I mean, I stayed in theater. Um, my friend Rossi uh, was a producer in film and television and theater until she died. And her sister Jane got into wardrobe and uh, until she retired. So there was a bunch of us that the library club kind of roped in. And I, I kind of did it in high school and stuff. Basically, um, I like to say, I, I felt like if people uh, liked me, they wouldn't kill me. And uh, Oshawa in the 50s was a hard town to be black in. We were the only black family. And uh, and so, yeah, it was, it was kind of like, um, and, and I was a I was a midget, right? Like I, I was a peanut. I was like five foot two, so a five foot two black guy with a fast big mouth was was not a recipe for a peaceful life. Um, but if you were an actor, and everybody saw you on stage and everybody liked you, well then they wouldn't beat you up at a dance. So that's how I got started in that. Fantastic. And did that work? I mean, did it work out for you the way you hoped it would? Yeah, I mean, you know, I was, I was still, I still caused fights because I still had a fast mouth. <laughs> but, but yeah, it, it, it did. I mean, I, 
I wouldn't say it was the most um, healthy thing to do, but I, um, I just kind of felt like uh, I had to, to go along to get along. And that lasted until um, my grade 12 year, when I realized at heart that um, really nobody gave a fuck about me. So um, I really started to pull back from uh, kind of like trying to be everybody's friend and all of that kind of stuff. And so a lot of people were, were you know, kind of taken aback and disappointed and, and kind of like, why are you being like this? I'm like, yeah, like, yo, I got, I got this, I'm making my way in the world in a very different way than you are. And you need to go what you need to do. And I need to do what I need to do. And so from there, I went on to theater school and et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I, I do think it, it, it created a, a kind of um, a privacy thing in my head. As you say, I, I, first time I'm talking about Highlander, I, I don't like to put my business out on the street. Um, I tend to be pretty private, except you'll find today I'm not very private at all. Um, because if I'm going to talk, then I'm going to talk honestly. That's what I've always done and talk openly about anything. But uh, but yeah, so it, it created that kind of um, where where I would have a persona for when I was in public and and being an actor and for who I was really and keeping the two very, very different. And it was it was basically survival. You know, and in the meantime, you know, y'all, y'all got to understand, like, wait a second, I had this out the other day for a friend of mine, you know, look, look, look at that hair. Like, that was Black Panther, Black Nationalist, Kill Whitey, you know, all of that stuff. I was like, yeah, <laughs> 1965. <laughs> Pretty stupid, right? pretty stupid no, but um but yeah that was that was how I got into theater uh, you know and then there was like a youth theater in the summer and then I got accepted into the Ryerson Theater School in the first year and then graduated out of that and you know on to do theater and and then a lot of film and um then you just have a you know what what is a career a career is what happens while you're planning and um, and so that happened, you know. Um, yeah. I I didn't really expect to have a theory, uh, uh, much of a career in film and television. There wasn't there wasn't a lot of uh, work for black artists in Canada in the in the seventies, um, but a lot of American film companies decided to come up to make movies in Canada because of a of a tax break deal. And so it became very popular for well-to-do dentists and doctors and, and, and lawyers to put their money into projects that were going to lose money. Because then they could write off not just what they put in, but their percentage of the loss. Wow. <laughs> so so for the for the the sort of like the the, the prime time bad awful Canadian movies a lot of those got made by Americans and they went oh man we need we need at least you know a black cop or a junkie or a, you know whatever whatever those those roles were and so all of a sudden I had a booming television career which was nuts it was nuts they were awful they were awful movies oh man they were awful but you know it's like everything else you learn I made my best friend on 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 a film set he was a uh, a cameraman dop and we're best friends to this day um so you learn your craft as you go along exactly and and it'll it'll count it even though you perceive them as being awful it, it'll uh led up to the career that you wound up having you know and that yeah. you know the, the 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 great roles and and gave you the opportunities you wanted so that's yeah as you say it's kind of uh, it'll it works out. Well, well, I can tell you what that did from a uh, viewer perspective is, especially when we got around to a series like War of the Worlds, I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, that guy is in this. 
this is going to be good because I like him because yeah, yeah. you had been in a bunch of stuff before that so yeah yeah war of the worlds yeah <laughs> yeah you know what war of the worlds had really great potential the idea that the that sam strangest and the and 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 it had for it was a quirky offbeat kind of craziness right and and you could see some of that, and then the the studios like said no, we wanted something else, and that's why the second season, you know, was so different from the first season. But even even in the first season, I mean, my character in War of the Worlds, they insisted that he have a Jamaican accent. <laughs> And so we did the first episode, man, you know, I'm doing the Jamaican accent, I'm working it out. And then they came back and said, no, that ain't working. That, that, that's, not, that's, not, that's, not, that's not the kind of quirk we need. So then I had to go in and dub all of that episode to get rid of the Jamaican accent. But the phrasing for a, a Jamaican accent is totally different than, than a non-Jamaican. So it was crazy. And there was one line that they just said, uh, we're, we're out of time. I said, there's, there's one line left to do. It said, no, man, we, we have the studio booked. We can't pay for another hour. And I went, but there's one, what, but, and out the door. And so I think in, in the first episode, there's still one line that is in a dead on Jamaican accent. I'm like, what? No, 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 no. The top line is two to the seventh power. The bottom line's to the third. Now, two to the seventh is 128, and two to the third is eight. But what do the numbers represent? Well, am I supposed to do everything around here? How am I supposed to know what it represents? It was, it was, it was like ridiculous. And then, yeah, and and then it, they just, they just really <laughs> took the quirk out of it, you know, which was sad. It was sad. It's so often the way, though, isn't it? You, ha you have a vision at the beginning and then the studios just get involved and the money gets involved and it's like, yeah. no, you know. Yeah, and, and, and you don't know what's going to, to trip somebody. Like on, um, on War of the Worlds, there was a producer in L.A. who didn't think men should wear pink and I wore a pink shirt and there was like, uh, there was like nightmare. You know, it was like you know you'd committed the biggest faux pas. And look at Amy with her pink headphones. It was like pink like that shirt. You can like. <laughs> yeah, right. And um, you know, on on Highlander, there was a producer who didn't like purple, and so all of a sudden you you couldn't wear purple. And he also believed that if you had if you were wearing a blue jean, a blue jeans and a blue jean shirt. You, they had to be exactly the same color. And so he would buy sets and then he would wash them all at the same time. So they would always be the same color. I was like, what the fuck is going on, man? This is stupid. It's just like, it's a blue jean shirt. So one dark, one light, who cares? Anyway, but you know, that was, that's kind of endemic in things. In, in Highlander, there's, um, there's one episode where Charlie's supposed to go out on a date right? And they do a, a solo shot of the girl waiting at the door of the gym. And when we filmed that originally, it was very attractive Filipino girl, right? And then the producer decided that the girl didn't look pretty enough. And then on another show, they turn around and they say, oh, we just got to pick up a shot. And all of a sudden, there's this sort of like five foot seven blonde and blue bombshell. And I go, but, but wait, <laughs> but wait, what was that other? There you go. There you go. Well, and of course, uh, War of the Worlds had the distinction of pre-Highlander uh, having you and Adrian Paul in an episode, unfortunately, your exit and his introduction. And I don't, yeah. I haven't watched it recently. And I don't remember if you guys actually had any scenes together. Um, no, man, man, that was, that was like, that was like one of the worst days of my life. in you know, that whole, that whole final episode. I mean, it was one thing, you know, that, um, 
uh, you're getting killed off a series of which you, you know, were one of the leads. I mean, that's, it's a hard deal. No, don't let anybody tell you it isn't a hard fucking deal because the minute everybody hears you're leaving, you become invisible on set. People kind of look through you. People kind is like, it's like you, you don't exist, right? The director, I don't even know who he was, but he, he would like be, he'd be like, there's a shot. I still remember this. There's a shot where there's supposed to be, I'm, I'm at the, 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 the computer table and uh, there's supposed to be an emergency button. And um, the guys, the guy's like, okay, yeah, no, 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 I gotta, it's gotta be here on the floor. And I said, you putting the emergency button on the floor? He said, yeah. I said, you do know he's in a wheelchair, right? You do know he's crippled, right? How's he supposed to push the fucking button if it's on the floor? And, and all he looked at me like, why are you causing trouble? Like, you know, anyway, I, I, I say when they kill me off the shows, they like to kill me off the shows. I mean, Highlander, what they are in, in War of the Worlds, I was, I was shot and then in a fire and blown up and shit. And in Highlander, I'm knifed and thrown off a building. I mean, you know, when they kill Philip Aiken, man, they do not want him coming back. <laughs> <laughs> no, no second Z's for me. Um, <laughs> but it's hard. It's, it, it's, it's a hard thing, you know? And um, there, there, was, there was a lot of other stuff, but some of it's just like, you know, like, old shit so why drag it up yeah. but um but yeah i mean you know you know highlander was i mean i've never i don't i don't think i've ever told this story you know before um i was i was going through a divorce and i told my agent i said i do not have the emotional capacity to go play other people right now. And so um, uh, my wife and I had split up. Uh, I was, I had nothing, man. I had nothing. I was living, I was living in, I had a, and this is, this is after I having a house and a career and the whole thing, right? And I'm living, sharing a flat with um, a theater school student. And all of my belongings are in one room. And I am working at uh, a bicycle shop for minimum wage. And I got a shout out to Chris and Carlos at Psychopath Danforth because they saved my life, right? And, and I just went in there and I worked. And, and I just told my agent, I, no, just, just forget about me as an actor. And this went on for months. This went on for months. And I didn't audition. I didn't do anything. And one day... She calls me up and says, Philip, please, 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 would you just go and do this audition? And I said, yeah, all right, why, fine, what, what's it for? And she said, I said, I don't even care, just give me the thing. <laughs> and so I got the sides and I, I memorized, uh, yeah, whatever. I got on my bike, I rode across town, um, got caught in a rainstorm. I got soaked. I went in to do the audition and there's the casting agent and a camera and me. And so I do it. And literally, you know, I don't care. I don't care about any of this. I get up. I care about the fact that the, the seat I was sitting in is so, there's a puddle of water that's come off me because I got so soaked. I got up. I got on my bike. I went back to work at the bicycle store. That was my Highlander audition. Wow. And... And I got the part. And meanwhile, still, you know, I've got my back is 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 pooched. I mean, you know, I'm in, I'm I'm actually in the worst kind of the worst for the, for that part of my life. It was the worst shape of my life. And um, and I was broke. And I was still paying the mortgage weekly on the family home that I didn't live at. And I paid the mortgage for that week. I had the money for the cab to take me to the airport and I had $85 in my bank account. And I'm like, 
if these people do not pick me up in Vancouver, I'm going to have to take a bus, right? And and so 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 just imagine, no money, living in a in a flat, and I get off the plane. They take me to see a doctor who's going to do my physical. The best acting job I've ever done in my life was touching my toes because my back was so fucked. And I end up at, what was it? The Meridian, the Sutton Place Hotel, like this five-star freaking apartment in this hotel. The place was so expensive. If I'd gone to buy breakfast, it would have taken all the money I had in the world. And then there I am going on set on Highlander. Nice. Bizarre. <laughs> It was, it was bizarre. <laughs> I was like, I don't understand how this is, this is my life. I'm in Vancouver renting, you know, convertibles to, to take people out on dates. And I'm in Toronto and I'm riding a bicycle and no money. That's, that's my start in Highlander. It's lovely to hear though, because that's just, that's just, you deserve that. And it's nice yeah. to feel that, you know, that they did, for want of a better expression, the universe gave you what you deserved. Yeah. Um, well, I, I like to think so, man. Yeah. <laughs> it was, it was tough. I was, you know, I was not in great physical shape uh, during Highlander. I mean, you know, I was still doing a lot of Aikido and stuff. Um, but, but it was, it was really the start of a lot of the problems, the issues that I've had in my back. In fact, the, the one episode, you guys will know these episodes better than me because I, I haven't watched any of them. But there was one episode where the car, my car gets stolen. Yeah. And, oh yeah. and Charlie goes running after the, 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 mm -hmm. the thing. Here's what I would urge you to do is I need you to go and, and play that scene again. And as I run away, now just before they cut the scene, just look at me. Because if you will look then, you will see I have lost control of my legs and they cut just before I do a one and a half gainer onto the road. Oh, Because I'm running, my legs give out and I flail, they cut and then I hit the deck. Oh. Oh. It, was, it, was, it was hard. It was hard. A lot of that stuff was hard you know well, running um, is hard even running I, I do a little bit of acting and i did a scene where i had to run and i'm in terrible physical shape and i was wearing shoes not trainers and i had to run that up and down his underpass yeah. like four or five times and i was in agony and yeah. you know, if, you, if you watch me you can see that i'm literally limping but i'm trying my best to run <laughs> yeah there <laughs> you know, was but, um there was there was a, a show i think it was i think it was top cops it was this, you know, cheesy cop show, and and um, every and and it was sort of like cops who'd done heroic things, and then they'd reenact the whole thing. So every time they had a black cop who'd done some, and it's all Americans. Anytime they had a black cop who'd done something, I got I got the job. And there was this one show where it was literally that running down this road in street shoes, and I ran this thing like three four times. And I remember leaving to go to the car to, to drive home. And I said, and I, I remember seriously thinking to myself, I will never run again. I could just, I could feel the run leave my body that night. And it, it haven't, haven't, right? It just, it was gone. I got it burnt, burnt it out of me. Yeah. Unfortunately, that was before Highlander. So, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Run only came made a a minimal appearance after that. <laughs> um, so, how did you find the whole production in, in general? Was it was it perhaps uh, different to War of the Worlds? Was it a bigger production in terms like you were staying in a lovely five star hotel? Um, yeah. Yeah, was it unlike anything you'd done to that point before? Um, to a certain extent, I mean, you know, um, I had, um, you I mean, some of the movies and stuff you got treated, you got yeah. treated really well. I mean, look, it was, it, it, there's a funny dynamic, right, on, on a, on a set, because it's, 
it's like going to camp. And you know, you leave camp and what do you say? You're the best. I'm going to keep in touch. You're my best friend forever. And that's true until you get on the plane and you go home and it's all gone. And, 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 and that's just the truth of it, right? You're, you're there, you're working. You may or may not socialize, but just because you're in a, in a show together does not mean that you share common interests, common political beliefs, common anything. You're just, you're doing your job. And I found everybody, everybody was nice, right? Every, and, and all of that, there's no, that's not a complaint. It's just, you're just there to do the job. And so you do, and you try to do the best. You be professional, you, you know, you, you try not, I, at least I go in, I don't try to cause any, any shit on set. Um, the times you got, it gets a little bit hinky because you got to stand up for your character and what are you doing there? And, you know, um, you never felt, I don't think I ever felt that Canadian actors were particularly given the same amount of uh, on deck clout as, as American actors. I think uh, no matter what your you you billing on the call sheet was, um, there was always a little bit of deferring to to the foreign actors, you know. But that's that's the nature of the beast. Oh, got to hear that. <laughs> you know, what? Just, what? Yeah, sorry, sorry. You wanted you wanted flowers and roses. This is why I don't. <laughs> this is why I don't talk about stuff. No, man. no, no. <laughs> No, no, I'm, no, sad, I'm sad for you. Yeah. I'm, you know, I'm sad for you. Not, not that it's sad to you, but you know, it's a, it's but, a shame. But it's, that, yeah. but it's, but it's just the business, right? Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. all it is. It's just yeah. the business. It's, it's in a sense, it's not personal. Um, look, we, we, I think it was this was during War of the Worlds, and we were getting together to watch. I don't know, was it a football game or? or or something anyway and then it was the producers and the four leads and all of that kind of shite and I just went you know what I'm tired of the, the this crap so I showed up in my kilt and <laughs> and the look on the Americans faces they're like but you're a guy and you're wearing a dress what are you what are you doing like is that a knife in your sock what's going on they, they, they're like they didn't get it they don't get it I still wear my kill. I got three kills. I still wear them to this day, right? Nice. Every, every, every first preview of a show I direct, I wear, I wear a kilt, and uh, uh, and opening night, I tend to wear a kilt. That's fantastic. What are the tartans? That's that's what everyone's uh, going to be. The 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 one the tartan one is a Kennedy tartan. Okay. Um, because um, I don't know if you know this, but there was a huge Scottish. Uh, you know, diaspora in the 15, 1600s, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of those guys ended up down in Jamaica. Right. And uh, kilts are easy to lift. Mm -hmm. And so the majority of Jamaican family names are, are Scottish names. Okay. You know, my, my family, the Gervins, Moody's, Dudneys, Cooks, all, all Scottish names. Interesting. Yeah. So, so my uncle John was a big Scottophile. He was mm -hmm. like, uh, and the Gervins were a sept of the Kennedys. And uh, when when my uncle John died, in homage to him, I went uh, to the Scottish store in Toronto that used to be on Young Street, and I got the whole drag, man. I got the socks, the 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 the. the the tartan, the spore, and the belt. I got the cutaway jacket. I got the whole freaking nice. deal. And every time I wear it, I said, this for you, John. Nice. Um, my other two kilts are Utila kilts. I don't know if you know Utila kilts. Yeah, I got I got a workman kilt and I've got a gray pinstripe kilt, which I just love to wear. I, I live in Portland, so I've been to Utila kilt in Seattle uh great place <laughs> yeah well you well you tell them i'm bigging them up send me a freebie <laughs> yes <laughs> absolutely <laughs>
Uh, so with a bit of a Scottish connection, had you ever heard of Highlander before you uh, you sort of got the role in the series? Um, I had seen the original movie. Okay. Um, and I thought that was pretty cool. Mm -hmm. But um, I was not um, I was not a fan boy of it. I mean, you know, it was just, you know, I'm a big sci-fi kind mm -hmm. of guy and and so I read hundreds of things like that a year. <laughs> really um and uh so yeah but but i will i will be be honest and say that audition that i did um it there was no there was no bada bing impact for me really literally it was just another audition i had no idea that i was what i'd really auditioned for i had no idea what I had really got mm. until I showed up in Vancouver. I know it was just like, yeah, okay. <laughs> Weird. How long were you were you uh, originally not like, given time for? Did, we, did they say like a couple of episodes or was it like a couple of seasons you were you were down for? Um, I came in the last episode of the first season, I believe. That sound right? Was, that's when he was introduced. Uh, that was a couple episodes into season two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. something like that. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. or it was I knew it was there was a bit of a patch over happening there. Okay. Um, and and I mean, you know, you you, I knew that I was there for the season. Okay. Um, but how that was going to play out afterwards right at least you know I mean at, at least on on Highlander you know you I, I got a chance to to last it out and and in the the show where where I die in I mean it was like still the full deal on on War of the Worlds they I remember uh they they, they shot the whole the whole death scene and stuff and I said are you sure you don't need a close-up of me lying on the floor dead like i just you know just think as a cutting point you might no 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 you know and they kind of brush you off like what do you know your chump change and you're dead now anyway so who cares the next year i get a i get a call i'm in the middle of of laying down a hardwood floor in my dining room and I get a call uh oh, Philip uh, we really uh, need to do this one shot of you and so I said all right fine so they send a driver pick me up take me out to you know North Jesus Toronto I have no idea where we are they're filming in some place and um it's the B unit not even the A unit they're filming another they brought a piece of the tile from the original set where they didn't shoot me before. They just lay it down on a floor, say, okay, just lay down there, sets up the camera, shoots it and says, okay, fine, you're, you're done. I said, okay, do I get a ride home? And they go, oh, uh, no, we, we don't have any drivers. I'm like, motherfuckers, you know? And, and the, the guy who was the head of transport was a guy who I had worked with a ton of times. You know, he and I knew each other really well. And he just said, Philip, don't worry about it. And I, he gave me a ride home in his own car. Like, so, so this, there's a kind of a, I mean, we say it's the business, but there's, there's, there, there's, there's, that implies some really great stuff and also some really ugly stuff. And so you get both sides of it whenever you're doing a series. Like who's got more say, who's, who, you know, there's a whole hierarchy, you gotta just deal with it and move on. Were you uh, along those lines then, were you able to um, add anything to Charlie, bring anything from, from your past or things that you knew into the character when he was talking? Um, yeah, I, yeah, that was, I think that was, um, that was, there was all, they were always open to that. Um, all of the fight stuff was primarily Aikido based, or there was a, an Aikido flavor, because that's what I trained in mostly was Yoshinkan Aikido. 
And so there was a bunch of that that, that came in. There's, there's a thing in Aikido, it's um, in Yoshinkan Aikido called a, a breath throw. And it's called that because it, it, it really, it's almost like you're knocking somebody over with your, with their, with your breath. I mean, not the whoopsie kind, right? Like where I just like <laughs> point my finger and you fall over. But so, so let's say the guy's doing a roundhouse punch. And what you do is you, you move at the, in, you match the speed and the velocity of the punch coming in and you move away from it. And one hand cuts the punch down and the other hand comes up to the side of their head. And literally what all you do is you move their shoulders off their hips. So now they're on ballast. So shoulder off the hips, arm comes down, they fall over. It's effortless, right? There's no, you don't, there's no, no muscle, no power. It's just boom. And they go, all right. So I, I, I worked on doing these throws for the entire, what, 27 years that I trained in Yoshinkan Aikido. I think in the dojo, maybe three times, three times it was perfect. But the fourth time was during that fight on Highlander. And I don't know what happened, but it was perfect. I felt so bad. The stunt guy's head bounced off the floor. And I'm like, oh man, I'm so sorry, but I didn't do anything. I just did that. <laughs> I just got out of the way. Um, so, you know, I tried to, I tried to bring that in. I tried to, um, I tried to bring um, certain realities of, of martial arts. I mean, Adrian, you know, He's a mensch, you know, he goes out, he went out there, he trained every, he'd come back in after every hiatus and he'd been training and learning and, and he was really, um, a really kinesthetically adept guy, right? And in an amazing way. Um, and I'm not, right? I'm not, I every, and I, and, and I, I kind of, in my heart, because I've trained so many people in martial arts, the ones that it comes really easy to are the ones that leave first. It's the ones who, who have to work at it. And I was one of those people who had to work at it. I'd come home from class, um, I'd walk in the door, I'd go in my dining room or living room, and I'd sit down, I'd, I'd stand up, I'd get a pair of shoes. And I would line them up like my opponent was supposed to be. So I'd do my move and then I'd move the shoe to match up so that I could learn. That's how I learned the kata, right? Cool. So it didn't come, it didn't come naturally to me. Um, but, and then there are the guys like, like Adrian, like a guy, Robin Young, a uh, martial artist that I know, or Robert Mustard, who's a martial artist that I'm a, who just freaking brilliant, man. They just look at it and it's in their bones. So, so I tried to bring that, especially like in the, the, the kendo scenes and things. I mean, oh God, I, I hit that guy so many times so hard. I, it's one of the few things I feel really embarrassed about. I just, I don't know what it was. I was just, yeah. I was just, I was just in this thing. Like if we're doing this thing for reals, for reals, this is what it's got to be. Yeah. And I, and he was, I don't think he, I don't think he liked me that much at the end of that. <laughs> Cause I, I was those shots, those shots to those head shots with the, with the, with the Shanai, they were for real. <laughs> right on camera. I mean, you know, we yeah, are great on camera. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, but the bra is like, what the heck are you doing? Why are you hitting me like that? <laughs> you know that they can add the sound later, Philip? I said, no, <laughs> yeah, boosh, boosh. That's being a jerk. <laughs> being a jerk. Well, how did you feel um, about the character himself? Uh, we're sort of within the show. 
Uh, obviously, you know, here's this guy who's been brought in. I think to to some degree, I kind of feel like he's a replacement for Tessa in a way. Oh, absolutely. Um, um, and uh, in terms of his development, I, we kind of saw a, a trajectory with Tessa that it almost seemed like it, the reason that she died is because that character wasn't really going anywhere. She was kind of, you know, she was mortal. She was always going to be mortal, you know, and, you know, yeah. he's got a great friendship with her and, and it didn't sort of seem to work. How did you feel knowing that you know charlie you know i guess you never know that you're not going to be immortal who knows you know you get a script one week and you you know you might die and wake yeah, up again yeah. um but yeah how did you kind of feel about the character and sort of what where did you kind of see him going did you sort of see that maybe it would end up with you being you know stabbed and thrown off a building or were you did you have other hopes for him well, I mean, sure. One, one. I mean, you know, you get to be, you know, what number two or three of four on a call sheet. You, you, yeah. you want to ride that pony till your bank account breaks, man. Like, <laughs> you, you, it's it's like a it's like a golden job. But I have to say, when it became apparent that I was never going to go to Paris to film, I yeah. kind of knew. <laughs> It was just a matter of time <laughs> before something happened. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was the only thing that I really regretted. I always wanted to go to Paris and just yeah. I just thought, oh man, to be shooting a series in Paris, come on. Yeah. Wouldn't that yeah, be the best? Cool. <laughs> yeah. But there you go. Uh, I don't think you're you're fully an adult until you've got vain hope. So now I'm really an adult. <laughs> uh, but you had some new misses. I mean, there, there was one, you know, one episode where, you know, your character, you know, you think he, he's he's done, you know, he's taken a couple of shots to the chest or whatever. And, you know, yeah, uh, you know, and did you, you know, when I always imagine, you know, when you're when you're an actor and you're getting, you're getting your latest script and you're, you know, really going, oh, God, OK, and the, yeah. no, no. Oh, oh, that's okay. I'm in, I'm in another scene. That's all right. I'm okay. Yeah, yeah. There, there, it is. It's and it's weird, right? It's 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 weird. So for for all of that, it means that you put um, your hopes and your heart to a certain extent into the character and into the project, but at the same time, you you have to. I mean, it's like anything else in life, man. You know. You can love the company with all your heart, mm. but it won't love you back. Mm. Yeah. And and you look at you look at um, War of the Worlds and Richard Chavez, who mm. was by and away the most popular character of the four of us. Boom. And the brother was like, damn it, he couldn't understand how, how he could be so popular and so <laughs> dead. <laughs> right? But that's, that's you know, other, there, there are people out there who, who, who are going to make decisions based on parameters that you don't know anything about. And, and you just have to go with that. So I, I, I never thought of any of that stuff as, um, as, as forever work. Right. I think one of, one of uh, maybe your best episodes uh, in the series was an episode called Run For Your Life, which was the episode with Carl Robinson, who was a, a, an immortal who started out as a slave and then became a, a baseball player and, and things like that. And that, in fact, was the episode I think that you were talking about where your car gets stolen and you had to run. And yeah, yeah. Um, how did you find that? Where was it? Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's especially back back then. I think you know they were talking about subjects that maybe people on TV weren't really willing to talk about. Um, how did you find that? I mean, I thought I thought that that was great. You know, um, primarily because you look at. You look at the majority of roles, all right, like in from from because I my my acting career started mid 70s and you go from you basically these you get cookie cutter roles. Right. Um, 
I mean, it used to be a joke where, you know, you just say, people would say, oh, I heard you got in a film. I said, yeah, I got the black guy role. And everybody, all the black people would kind of go, oh, uh, so you get dead in the first 20 pages, right? And then everybody else gets six more weeks of pay revenging you. You kind of go, yeah, that, that doesn't feel right. Um, so you don't, you, you, I mean, I'd start off and I'd get these, um, basically, uh, was it um, Night Heat was a cop show. And I think I died seven times on Night Heat. They, because they didn't have enough black actors. So I'd come in and I'd be the junkie or I'd be the pimp or I'd be the druggie or I'd be, you know, there was a time my leg was in a cast and I said, I, guys, I can't come in. I'm, I mean, I'm in a, I said, we'll, we'll write the character. So he's, we've got a cast on. How's it look? Like World War Three, Right, so I'm hobbling around. So you look and, and then, <clears throat> you get to a point where you move up and you start to get more uh, mainstreamy roles. So then you're, you know, the young cop, the young activist, the doctor, and then you grow up and you get, and then you get to be the mayor and, and then you end up doing Hallmark movies. So there's, there are very few occasions where I really feel that there were roles that there were, there was places to stretch and grow and to, and to bring all of that stuff, that artistic stuff, forward. And, and that's partly why, you know, like, I don't miss, I don't miss acting very much, right? And because I just think most of the roles, uh, even now that get put out and offered to me, they're, they're, they're cookie cutter roles. So, I mean, when I was, when I would be in particularly sitting let's say I've only had five characters in my entire career and you just play versions of those five characters so something like I mean the potential was there in more of the worlds I think there was a greater potential and a, and a bit more activation in Highlander where some of that stuff could go but it was still you know still a little magical negro you know still a little um, he's going to be the guy within certain parameters. He's never going to be the guy who gets to actually rage. Mm. Never be that guy, right? Of which I think is the big driver in art, at least for me, is, is, is that what's inside? What, how do you let that out? How does that seep out? How do you... How do you bring real depth to characters? And I think, I mean, I'm going to segue a little bit to, to what I do now, which is directing in theater. And that's, I think, the strength of me as a theater director is I make sure that, that there is room for that rage. There's room for the reality. It's not about being magical. It's not about being a stereotype. It's about being rich, complex human beings. And you can do that in theater. It's harder to do that in episodic TV. A lot of times now, I mean, you know, when I first started filming and you were doing, you were doing shows, you, were, you had seven days of filming. And by time I stopped doing episode episodic work, you were down to five days, four and a half days of filming. There's no, there's no room. There's no time, right? You're lucky if you get three takes. So you're, you're just, so if you're going to do that, then you start regurgitating your, your shtick. Yeah. And then, and then that's all that, that, that's your career is regurgitating shtick. Well, it makes total sense then that you sort of moved away from that and moved towards, at what point did uh, Obsidian come in? Because that was, I think, the real kind of, a really big deal for you, I think, from what you've said, yeah. and, and, you know, uh, in terms of being able to, to do what you really felt was important. Yeah, I mean, Obsidian started in 2000, 
I mean, I at no point in no point in my life did I ever turn around and say, "Hey, Philip, I think you should get into directing." Never, it, it, it never happened. But what did happen was, um, I say yes, mm -hmm. and uh, there was a guy, Joseph Jomo Pierre, who's a great writer, and I, you know, Joe, I I love the man deeply, and he writes from a, a black male perspective from Scarborough, Ontario. And there's not a lot of writing like that around, frankly. And, and so uh, people would, Joe would come up with a project and people would say, no, oh, no, I can't do that. Oh, I don't know. I don't know if I'd be right for it. And he'd say, and then I'd be second or third or fourth. And, it, and I'd say, yeah, sure, I'll do it. And that's where I learned. That's where I got. And, and because we respect each other so much, we could have these kinds of conversations, which, which opened the door to how to get to real clarity and, and say the hard things in a way without apologizing for them, in a way that is, is not about being offensive or, or attacking. It's just about the, these are people and people have ideas and needs and desires and how do we bring that forward? And from there, the next thing you know, I'm a director, <laughs> right? And, and and I think about it a lot. I mean, I think about art a lot. I mean, I've never, <clears throat> I've never taken a directing course. I've never been an assistant director. I mean, I see a lot of a lot of the new directors in the in the younger cohorts, and they've gone to university and they got degrees in directing and they got and they're and they're brilliant, right? I, I don't know how they do what they do. And I know that when they come in and sit in my rehearsal hall, they are intensely confused as to how I get the stuff out of my artists that I get out of them. Because they, they just look at me and say, all you're doing all week, the first week, Philip, all you did was tell stories. And I go, yeah, I know. And there was a reason for it. And yeah, we blocked 80 pages. You just didn't notice. Because when we did the run at the end of the first week, 98% of the play was already blocked. And the telling of stories was, a, was an integral part in building the, the community and the trust of the artists. Because if I can sit there and tell them how this happened to me in my life, and it directly relates to their character and it relates to them. And it's the first time they're hearing a black man in a rehearsal hall speak to this. They're now given a freedom. They're, giving, they're given an opportunity to empower their character in a different way. The lead for the show that I'm doing, that I start doing in about three weeks, um, I emailed her this week and I said, um, you know, uh, can we just get together with the, uh, the wardrobe designer? I want to talk about your costume. I want to have your input into the costume. And she was taken aback because nobody does that. They kind of go, this is what you're wearing. And then you, in your heart, you go, I hate it. This looks like shit. I'm going to look like ass. I ain't never going to, this is no good. But okay, yeah, I'll do, I'll wear that. That's so fun, right? That's, that's the story that goes on. And so already, you, you, you already in your heart are, 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 are holding back from committing. And, and so we had a great conversation and then she wrote a couple of days later and said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm having second thoughts. I don't know if this is going to make it look this or that. And um, I, I don't, I've never, I've never been asked to collaborate in this way before. And I wrote back and I say, this is precisely why I do it. Because your collaboration, you're the one who's going to be up on the deck doing this, you know, 40 odd performances of this show. If this, if every single piece that, that about this character doesn't 
suit you. You will never pull it into you, the marrow of your bones. It will always be just like something that's sitting on the surface of your skin. How do you get that depth? How do you get that clarity? That to me is, is I spend all my time, you know, when I'm thinking about art, that's the kind of thing I'm thinking about. How to, how to take anything from anywhere in the world, how, to, how do I then weave that into my, my artistic process? This is not a process that, as you can tell, is going to lend itself to five-day episodic television. <laughs> <laughs> no, no I, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and 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 so that's that's kind of why um, that's kind of why I I I I pulled back from acting. And you know what, man? I mean. I've been offered some some acting gigs and there's a couple that I went, oh, I really love this part. I really, but there are so many words and I do not want to embarrass myself and I do not want to be one of those senior artists who everybody's like, is he gonna get the line out? Is he gonna, you know? And I've seen that on stage. I mean, it's I'm making a joke, but I've I've watched a, a senior artist just and every time he went to open his mouth, I was like, oh my God, please, please. I'm not even a religious guy. And it's Easter weekend. I'm not even a religious guy. And I'm going, please let him be able to remember the line. I did not want to be that guy. Right. Oh, but no, yeah. you shouldn't let that stop you. I think, but but yeah. you but you, but but you, but I I well obviously I disagree. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Because because I because I believe in the art and and I respect art and the theatrical art so much that I want and I expect me to do the best that I possibly can, and. Um, you have to you have to train for for a season down at a festival like Shaw. I mean, you know, I, I'm not out riding my bike and doing walks every day right now just because I think it's fun, because it ain't fun, but I'm doing it because I've got to have the physical stamina to be able to do three and a half months worth of rehearsal. Right? So this is, I, for me anyway, directing and, and theater is a, is a full body exercise. It's, and, 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 and I, may, I may insist as part of my contract, I get a nice comfy, you know, chair. Like it's gotta be a rocking chair, I, got all, I get all that. But it's a full body exercise because, um, it's it's a lot of physical work on on my side yeah i'm sure i'm sure it is and i wonder actually whether your your acting has has helped you with your insight to become the kind of director you are because i think i know a few directors who who were who still are actors and and they find that that helps them direct other actors yeah um, it does i mean although there there's a, a really interesting process um i mean they're they're guys that i've directed a lot who are now becoming directors and you know are just doing their first directing things and so I find that really flattering and amusing um, that my language comes out of their mouth which yeah. I, <laughs> breaks me up quite honestly um, but because then I go oh, is that what I sound like ooh um, but but there's but part of the process because every director has to build their own process and 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 you take the language that you have that resonates with you and then you build on it and you improve on it. So um, most actors who become directors are usually very good right at the top of uh, interpersonal relationships on the deck because that's what they know as an as an actor is how do you build the character? How does that character relate to the other character? And that's great for a certain kind of theater. But to become a director, I believe you have to have an artistic vision and a philosophy about the work that those interpersonal relationships connect to, 
what are you trying to say, right? What is, what is your overarching vision? What is, what is the, 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 the backbone of the dinosaur skeleton and that everything has to fit? So I did a production, um, and it's, I mean, it's a play that, that, I mean, I like a lot. I mean, although I think people like, the, like it more than I ever did, but it, it, I guess it's kind of my production of, of, of uh, Master Harold and the Boys. And inevitably, it's done. It, it's set in apartheid South Africa, and it's uh, a young white guy and two older black men. And most productions, I think, virtually all productions, center the young white guy and do that. And I go, well, no, because I'm a black man. They're black people. We're all. <laughs> I'm not going to do a show. Would you? So everybody's got to be centered. Everybody has to be full forward everybody but just by having that philosophical idea by 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 then giving the weight to those those two other characters created a balance in the production that elevated it to something else mm -hmm. but if you don't if you don't have that overarching philosophical idea, you will just kind of do the production that's listed in the script. And so there's a, there's a leap, a, a kind of a, a, a philosophical leap that you have to take to, I think, really become a director. What, what is it that I need to say with this production? Beautiful. So along those lines, do you do you have any and, and forgive me if you have already done this, but do you have any plays or movies in you that you want to write? You know, um, well, I, I'll, I'm just going to embarrass myself right now. So you see this? This is yep. the yeah. Okay. Yeah. I bought this four years ago because why? Because there's a book that I'm going to write about theater and art, etc. And a friend of mine said, Philip, the reason you're not writing it is because it's so much to write. What you need, you're great at speaking it. Get this recorder and just talk it out. I haven't even put the damn batteries in, okay? <laughs> so <laughs> So every, so every time, every single time I go down and direct at Shaw, every summer, I say, Philip, you can make your tea, you can sit out on your front porch, you can just talk, man, you can, you know, there are a lot of, there are a lot of youngsters out, they'll, they'll come and they'll sit there on the deck, and you can just talk to them about art, and you'll have your book done, the thing is still in the case, and this, yes, I do have, yes, I do, Joe, I, I have, I have stuff that I want to write, and no, I have not got around to it. I mean, but but it's it's like meta stuff, right? Like I don't know if you know um, Artemisia Gentileschi. She's a uh, a, a woman uh, painter, and she's got a great story. She was a student of Caravaggio. Her work is really powerful and visceral. And um, she was raped by one of her teachers and she went and took him to court. And this is like in Venice in the 1500s. And, you know, she won the trial. I mean, there's a whole bunch of stuff. So, and, and, and there's, there's been a bunch of stuff written about her. But what interested me in that is that story extracted to to today and, and women in the arts, women in society. One of the, the big points about Artemisia's trial is that when she was being questioned, she was put into a chair that had this device over her hands and basically they would be torturing her to make sure she told the truth. Okay, she's the victim here. <laughs> she's being, okay? So yeah. that, 
So, so I look at that and I go, would I write a, a, a naturalistic play about Artemisia Gentileschi? No, I would not. I don't know what I would write, but I tell you, I know exactly what the set looks like. The set is this big, massive, oversized chair and these things that her fingers, the actor's fingers fit in. It's a one person show. And the rest of the deck is a series of levers and pulleys and cogs and wheels. Like the whole, the whole freaking theater is full of this. And in the course of the play, a hand comes out and pulls a lever. And it goes tick, 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 And then we continue on with the play. Wow. I would watch that. <laughs> but but so so yes, I have ideas like this. They're, they're these big installation pieces. That's my problem is that the longer I do this, the bigger and more complex things become. And the but the budgets for for theaters aren't increasing. So I I just sent in a, a concept for an indie opera they've asked me to direct and literally um <laughs> i wrote this is the prologue this is the prologue version one version two version three version four each one taking less resources <laughs> each piece of the of the opera three or four versions all taking less resources down to we could have eight singers. They could be fully wardrobe. They should be movement directed down to all the singers are in the pit. We'll never see them, right? Depending on what people's budgets are. So my I, theatrical ideas are large, getting larger. Um, it's hard, man. It's a lot of time. It's a lot of focus to try to try to pull this stuff out. But every, every year, um, I, I have new hope. Do you think the past two years have made much of a massive difference in how theatre is? Yeah, the last two years have been really hard um, because 2020 was my last year at Obsidian. And so I had left a legacy year of programming and I was going to go off the show. I mean, I had this all worked out, right? I was going to, uh, uh, I, I, it was just all worked out. I was going to finish the show, uh, finish my time at Obsidian. I was going to be down at Shaw. I was going to do a show. I was going to leave to go visit my friends in France. I had this whole freaking year worked out. It all disappeared and ended up sitting on my porch. And so there's a kind of, mourning that goes on for the loss um and and yet at the same time there's a there's there's a lack of completion uh -huh. um this room this is my front room spare bedroom office and i remember thinking that in march 2020 because the place was just like full of stuff and junk i said you know philip yo man you're gonna come in you know clean this up and it was like October 21, before a single thing got cleaned up in this room. And, and there was a kind of just this lethargy and this kind of uh, inaction that, that took over. And I would, I would say that, you know, you skate between, yeah, I'm really up, I'm, I'm funky, I'm keen, I'm cool, I'm groovy, and I'm a bit depressed. Right. And you and you kind of can go through that in a day. Yeah. So it's it's been it's been tricky. I think um, I, I try I'm trying now not to ask people when I see them, how you doing? Because hmm. there's no good answer because we all it's all been shit. Yeah. <laughs> and there's no good answer. Right. Nobody wants to say, oh, if I ask Philip that he's going to talk for an hour. Like we don't we don't want that. We don't want that. 
yeah. we did. So, so yes, Joe, I, I do. I have things that I, that I think about. And I mean, I, I write, I'm a, I'm a big fountain pen guy. I mean, I, I collect and restore fountain pens and stuff. Um, and I've got journals and, and, uh, you know, I've got like one book where I just write down things about art that supposedly is a reminder for when I get the, you know, the vocal copy done. Okay. And another thing that just is ideas, things that just come, things that I read. Um, um, Megan Whelan Turner has a great series of books and in her last one, She's got a poem called The Invitation. I just thought there's a, a fucking great poem. So it's part of my part of my process to keep uh, the, the brain working is trying to memorize poems on a regular basis. I just I just ordered an, uh, uh, an, a biography of uh, John Donne and uh, with a bunch of his poetry because uh, um, I partly memorized one of his poems called The Token, and I want to memorize the rest of it. Because if you do a, a, a mental activity consistently, your brain will actually uh, change to make that activity better and easier. <clears throat> so if you want to be good at memorizing stuff, you have to memorize stuff, and then your brain makes it easier. And that's why when you talk to you know, old, old actors who've been at, at, at like Shakespearean festivals, they can say, oh, yes, well, when I did King John in 1954, I remember this speech. And then they go like on for like 20 boring minutes because they've been doing it for, for years and years and it's grooved in. And so to go back to me not wanting to forget lines and embarrass myself, that what I'm trying to do is the mental memory work to try to get that patterning happening again. Good. But we may still see you in something again. You, so. you, you may indeed. People, every I once hope in so. A while, every I once in so. a while. Yeah. Oh, well, good. I will always hold out hope for that. For okay. Sure. <laughs> good. Philip, it's been wonderful listening to you. Thank you so much. Uh, My pleasure on and doing this i'm i'm so glad we caught you at the right moment i'm so <laughs> uh that you were happy to come and do this uh it has been yeah no it's been absolutely lovely um thank you to you. thank you um all of you grant joe amy and uh this is philip aiken from highlander heart hold fast and don't lose your head <laughs>